16 number, 15 number, 16 number, 17 number, 18 number, 19 number, 20 number, 21, All right. Yeah. Yeah. I think right there. There, there he goes, turning up his nose at the soup again. You know, and then you. So it, make sure you present him to the audience that way. You know, here he is. Here's my, here's my cruddy side. <laughs> Forty-two years old, the widow of a worker, and the mother of a worker. Before I spend a single kopeck, I look and look at it. I try first one way, then another. One time I'm skimping on wood for the fire, and the next time I skimp on clothing. Nothing helps. I see nothing to be done. Okay. Um, just, okay, I think that's the... He got into trouble when, in his younger years, he wrote some kind of a play about a dead soldier. That, that, I don't know if anybody's heard anything about it. Uh, where he, uh, it was about World War One. He spent a lot, he's, I forget. How do you expect to suck? It's up to you to take the state and turn it over, bottoms up, till you have filled your plate. Help yourself, no need to wait. If there's no work and you're a poor man, how do you intend to sup? It's up to you to take the state and turn it over, bottoms up, till you then yourself become the poor man. Then there'll be work, there'll be no poor man. The mother believes her natural enemy or those strengthening her son in his revolt. She would be glad were her son still sweet-tempered still gladly seen by his oppressors, for then he might somehow elude the misery and possibly make his way among the exploiters. Nothing but danger can greet these efforts to improve his shelter. You know, it's see this son and this mother, and, and you know, don't do that. That was wrong. Um, do the just the real action. Try and flatten your voice out as much as possible and make your body movements very specific. We've just now set eyes on our first rascal. You, Pavio Massa, you are going to learn your place. Sit respectably when I speak to you. You must not shout, Sonia. You cried too soon. I expect you to yeah. save your tears. You will need that. Just a little bit about explaining basically what's going on is we're trying to make the mother understand the, how ownership is power and how ownership can hurt and how ownership is domination when used wrongly. Um, in the beginning of this play, this is one. This is one of the fundamental gender issues in this play because you can see how the mother is when she says at the beginning that she's living in his house and she's feeding and clothing herself with his money and she's worried because Papa will get dissatisfied with the soup and then she doesn't think she'll have any more place to stay and Papa's very seems to be very curt with the mother and when she refuses to make tea he just brushes her off and in here he seems like he's just coaching her through like a child. I told her, but it doesn't over wet feet. Even so, I'm her best friend. We are one heart and one soul, you know? But never in your life did you see such stubbornness. I'm sick, Lasova. I want to go to the factory in my place and sell the food. Look here, Marie, I say. You are a horse now, but tell me, why are you a horse? And she says, if you're going to, going to still go on nagging me about those wet feet, and if all you can think of is to blame me, then I'm going to- I'm telling her, she got the wet feet. I don't know what to do. She, I have to sell lunches for her. On your way. No other solution has emerged from the bargaining. Can't you see this means a strike? Only a strike can save the Kopeck. I warn against yeah, some major lines here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You want to try it from where you come in again? Uh, hold on. Okay. 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 And to me especially. Ivan, I think there's not much distinction between what Ivan or Pavel or Anton are well. saying the scene. Um, Ivan seems to go about most of what everything he's saying throughout the play without being too really dogmatic. I mean, he, he does one or two things about the worker struggles and songs and stuff, but other than that, he's pretty much a straightforward guy with a sense of humor. I think that when she says that, when Anton, it's kind of, this is also, I think we owe you an explanation. Like, everyone starts feeling, oh, we have to sit her down, we have to calm her down, we have to appease her. Sounds like really cool. And, and I think, for me at least, when I read it, that's where I think everyone's kind of migrating towards sitting down at the but table. But it's Anton who triggers the idea when he says, we can see 
we owe you an explanation. Maybe, I mean, maybe it, is it or isn't it his factory? It does belong to him. You see then, this table belongs to me. Why don't you think Mr. Sokonov should cut the wages he pays? Uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I see her role is just she's trying to understand what's going on. She just doesn't see what what everyone makes a big deal about. Because she she sees life as very she sees very fatalistic. Well, fatalistic, and also she sees kind of black and white. This is how things are. This is the way they should be. And she doesn't see a lot of the linkages that go on. She seems to see it very. And we can understand why the workers are striking, and we can understand that. But I think in some ways, especially in your part, you're going to have to try and think of how she is viewing it, like just her upbringing and how, what, what is her main objective. Worker, revolutionary. On the 1st of May, 1905, 11 o'clock in the morning, at the corner of the Boulevard of Our Savior, the decisive moment, he said, I won't give it up. We are not bargaining. Good, Smilgan, we said. That's the way, and everything will be all right. Yes, he said, and then he fell forward, for they had shot him. And they ran toward him. And for the workers, the supreme flag. And, and so you will see it, again and again, gladly or ungladly, according to your place in this struggle, which cannot end otherwise. and you tune them just by cutting off the edges. Her son was arrested in the 1st of May demonstrations, and her, she, the police gave her notice to leave her home. I disapprove of all your activities, all of them in the extreme. They're all utter nonsense, as I've proven to you many times before. Of course, these matters shouldn't affect you, Mrs. Vlasova. Uh, your plight is apparent, and I have, moreover, been somewhat in need of someone to take care of this place. As you can see, it's rather untidy. Oh, well, are you home already, Nikolai Ivanovich? Obviously. All right, I will now write three easy words. Branch, nest, fish. I repeat, branch, nest, fish. Must it really be branch, nest, fish? Study from bottom up, for you are Purpose with purpose, purpose, strong, It is not proud. too late. Study the ABC is not enough, but study it. Do not become discouraged to begin. You must know everything. You, you must, must prepare, prepare to, to take, take control now. now. Okay, cut, let's go back. All right, so when you guys walk, you know, you're walking to God, or you're walking for your country, or you're walking to free Kuwait today, or, you know, whatever, okay? But oh, what helps is to be... Oh, here we go here. Knowledge is of no help, not at all. What helps is to be good. Well, you just let us have your knowledge if you don't need it. How about, okay. talk about the interaction between... Get your ass in gear and get some work done. Scene, like stage point, point, and the... And um, the scenes where you're going to have words used and stuff, like... Okay, see, that's what we need to know. I mean, like, do we want to use that? Do we? Are, are you guys planning to have a word drop down and say music or chorus? No, I'm talking about, like, um, remember how when we cut scene seven, mm -hmm. and uh, we have to have the introduction to scene eight. Okay, and then we'll see if you have the teacher and you have the blackboard. Nice, outsider. I had no idea you were on strike, but I can see you're making a strong fight of it. Please excuse us for giving you that bump. The strike has been going badly. We have no strike fund and no food. 
A whole mob of strike rapers is coming just tomorrow. They've slaughtered the pigs and the calves for them already. Fabio? When did you come home? I just got here, Mom. Where were you? I had another meeting with Andre and Ivan. Why are you out with them again? Because it's important for them. Important for who? Why, for me and for you and for the neighbors. How is you going out with Ivan and, and Pav uh, Ivan and, and your friends important for me, important for the neighborhood? So you're going to be tired for work yet tomorrow. All right, no, no. Okay, this um, is stupid, but talk really loud. Okay. Enunciate and talk really loud. This is well, Mother, you see, Jeff. Andre and Ivan and I, we believe that we constantly think about how bad off we are and how horrible our situation is. I mean, I've watched you, Mother. You scrimp and you save with the money I bring home, and it seems so hard to feed and clothe us, and we're not living well. And we constantly talk about it, and I hear you in the kitchen. But you have but a job. I have a job. And you get your Popex. But I have Sweet. no dignity in that job. Our way, I create, try to create density, but I also want the audience to be able to think what's going on in front all over. No, you don't really know what they're doing. Do you want us to stand still? I mean, like, with our feet. You don't, you don't have to stand still. You can, you can mingle, like I said. You can mingle. You can occasionally. You can do anything. Just, just, just do what you can to keep the strike going if they have their discussion. Ryan, can I be more in the middle? I feel really strange being so close to her. Because I'm standing right out here, and all of a sudden, she just... Okay, right. You just threw a stone at me from five feet away. It doesn't make any sense. Red peace land! Red peace land! Red peace land! like her fight Liable. tenaciously, reliably, Hardworking. cleverly, Clever. into Bear, Glasgow, Leon. Okay. That's the other thing that I'd like to see you all move toward in the next week or so, is uh, uh, an overall vision of this play. Uh, how raggy are the dresses and the props and the, and the set and the, um, what level of poverty are you talking about? also that, like, the importance of changing, um, to show um, different You cannot set that printing press up here in my house. You know I'm with you theoretically, but putting them here, that I cannot have. Did I hear you right, Nikolai Ivanovich? That you don't want to print these papers here? And why? Well, the coat is for coats, the felt is for coats for her children. Marfa Kateranova, I say, just now I saw your children coming home from school. In coats. He and I were two. The third it was. The common cause, commonly driving us, that is what united us. How often I myself have heard sons talking with their parents, but how much better our talks were about the third, that cause which we held in common. For many people, the great and common cause. That we got given one or two people, maybe right now with a brainstorm, we could write down what sum the geometry is, then one person could sum all that up for two people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That, would, that I mean, because it would sound better than, than, I guess, going down the line saying, well, you know, I think a job yeah, is really 
<laughs> you know, what about sixth person? Unless we all have a company. Ditto. Totally. <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> See that, Sonia? You always have to pick the lesser evil. In the end, it's the lesser evil for Mr. Murotov, too. You would rather pay your daddy more than less. But you do need a coat. Now, if a 20 Kopex coat were what you needed, this would be your coat. Put my pattern back where you got it from. <laughs> oh, it's only a joke. So why must you mock the child? Is it I who mocks you, Sonia? Or Mr. Muratov, or the coat manufacturer? But when he went to the wall to be shot, he went to a wall made by men like himself. Today will be the victors of tomorrow, and never is changed into today. And so she marched with us, tirelessly. Ha! mother and her hostile son. Plainly is it seen how the, ba how the battle outside cannot be kept from this room. And no, and no one escapes unharmed from the field, field swarming, swarming with, with battle. Such a shame to pour out soup like this for my son. Yet I can't put any more fat in. Only last week they took a copic an hour out of his wages and there's nothing I can do to make up for it. Don't I know he needs more nourishing food? What, with his long hours and heavy work? He's so young, he's hardly grown yet. And he reads these thick books, and he never did think the food was good enough for him. And now it has gotten worse yet. He just gets more and more discontent. 
whose discontent comes from having seen his situation. And the entire world waits upon his discontent. There he goes, turning up his nose to soup again. Yet there's nothing I can do to make it any better. It won't be long now, and he'll notice that I'm no use to him. I'm just a burden. And he'll be on his own way, won't What am I to do? I, Falagea Vlasova, 42 years old, a widow of a worker and a mother of a worker. Before I spend a single kopeck, I look and look at it. I try things first one way and then another. One time, I'm skimping on wood for the fire, and the next time I skimp on clothing. Nothing helps. I see nothing to do. Just see how far she is still from seeing her task, her immense task. She still wonders how to dispose of shrinking wages, so we can live on still less, thanks to her quiet spirit. When you joined the movement two weeks ago, you told us we could come here to you when the movement had special work to be done. What do you plan to do? We need to print our leaflets for today at the factory meeting this evening. We will see whether that a copac be taken away from us. The strike. We brought along the hectograph and paper. Please, please, sit down. My mother will make tea. <laughs> Where is Cedor? My brother didn't come. Going home last night, he saw someone following him who seemed to be a policeman. So he went straight to the factory today. Please. Talk quietly. It is better if my mother doesn't hear us. I have never told her about these things. She 
she couldn't be of use for us in any case. Here's the stencil. I don't like to see Fabia get mixed up with this sort of people. Get them all excited and involve him in Lord knows what. I don't set out tea for such people. Oh, yeah, Bob, what are you talking about? The mother thinks her natural enemy are those strengthening her son in revolt. She would be glad for her son still sweet temper, still gladly seen by his oppressors. For then he might somehow elude the misery and gradually make his way among the exploiters. Nothing but danger can greet these efforts to improve his shelter. Even such shelter as this. I'm afraid I can't boil any tea with what there is. I, I couldn't make a decent cup. Then make some thin tea for us, Mother. Just what right do they have? Come in here, talk so softly I can't hear a thing. Fabio, I don't want the landlord noticing how people come here at five in the morning to print things. That won't help in the least to pay our rent. This lasts over. You must believe us. We are more interested in helping you pay your rent than anything else. As a matter of fact, that is all we really care about. Well, it may not look that way. I just don't know about that. Pavio? Your mother is not pleased to have us here, is she? She finds it very difficult to understand that we must do this here, just that she can buy tea and pay the rents. Well, they surely have thick skins. As if they've noticed nothing at all. What are their plans with Fabio? He was happy to have a job when he first went to work. True, he wasn't paid much. And if they take another kopeck from him, I'd rather not eat myself. But it's disturbing to see how he reads these books. And I worry about how he and this crowd run around at night, and he doesn't get his sleep, and he gets all excited. This way, he'll only lose his job. Take the state and turn it bottoms up Till you, you yourself become the foreman Then there'll be work, be no poor man If you have an empty plate How do you expect to sup? Do they laugh and call you weak? Don't waste time, start your promotion Bring the plan for action to the meet that they have got in motion. Soon their time will come to speak. Laughter then will ring among the weak. If you have an empty plate, how do you expect to sub? Be careful, the police are coming. Hide the paper. I'm here to search your house, Pavia of Lasso. Ah, oh, but what kind of a lousy bunch is this to be mixed up with? This is the sister of Cedor Kalatox. We were arrested earlier today. These are the right ones, all right. What have you done with my brother? Your brother conveys his best wishes. Momentarily, he preaches revolution to the bedbugs. And he's enjoying a rather large congregation. Sadly enough, he doesn't have any leaflets. As I recall, we still have one or two adjacent cells to Didn't I hear the lilt of a beautiful song being sung here just now? Well, we of the police would like to be able to sing along too, even if our voices are perhaps a little harsh. <laughs> Please notice that, over. For example, now I'm forced to tear open your pouch. Is this what you wanted? 
You don't find any rubles in there, do you? That is because we are workers and do not earn very much. You are a respectable woman, as I am aware. And it's true there was nothing in the couch which might be deemed unrespectable. Blast over, blast over. Decent people are not sly. Ought you to be sly? Here's the lard pot with its little spoon. The, the old sentimental lard pot. Ah, now it has fallen on the floor, and we can see there is only lard inside. Not much. There isn't much lard in it, Commissioner. And in the bread box, there isn't much bread. And in the jar, there isn't much tea. In that case, I believe it must be a political lard pot. <laughs> blast over, blast over. Why must you tangle with us bloodhounds in your old age? Sit down, we'll be shot. Why did you have to throw the lard pot on the floor? Pick up the lard pot. That's Andre Nahutka. He's from Little Russia. Andre Maximinovich, no. Isn't it true that you have more than once been thrown into jail for offenses of a political nature? Yes, in Rostov and Saratov. Police there, the police had some manners. <laughs> Well, uh, sir, might you possibly know which of the rascals who circulate this very treasonous leaflet within the factory? We've just set eyes on our first rascals. You, Pappy of Blasov, you are going to learn your place. Sit respectably when I speak to you. You must not shout so. Please, you are a young man, and you've never had to suffer. They pay you regularly to come in here, rip open my couch, and see that there's no lard in my lard pot. You cry too. I advise you to save your tears. You will need them. The day will come when your slyness will do you no more good. When they have gone, we must beg your forgiveness, Pelagia Klasova. We had no idea they suspected us already. Are you very much frightened, Mrs. Blasova? Yes, and I can see that Pavio's on the wrong path. Well, but do you think that it is right that your whole home is wrecked? Just because your son fights for his Kopex, they do not do the right thing. But what he is doing is not right either. Hold it. Stop here. She shows us astonishing things. She condemns her enemy as cruel, but she calls only the practice cruel, and not its legality. Some other people condemn the law that is cruel and forgive those who practice it. Both ways are wrong. The law cannot be separated from those who serve it, nor the state from its rulers. It is no more just than they. For men have made it, for men it comes forth. For men it is planned, but not for all men, for only the few, and these are not you. How quickly the rumor gets around, and how long it lasts, saying the state is different from those who run it, more noble than those using it for their own good. It is said they are good people and a bad job. We hear talk they are bad people serving a good cause. But in truth, he is bad who acts badly, and the cause of bad people is bad. So never say the state is good that treats you badly. Don't say it would be better. Oh, were it better, there would be no more state. So never say the state is good that treats you badly. Don't say it could be better. No. Were it better, there would be no more state. Supposing we don't hand out leaflets today, just because the police are beginning to catch on, then we'll have been nothing but windbags. Those leaflets have to be handed out. How many leaflets do we have? Pavio, how many leaflets do we have? About 500. Who will hand them out? It's Pavio's turn today. Ivan, who was supposed to hand out leaflets? Pavio, but it's not so dangerous. It's not so dangerous. You want to send Pavio and you say it's not dangerous. It's necessary. It's necessary. The reading of books and coming home late is what begins it. Then there's work here in the house with machines that have to be hidden. And everything is carried on through soft voices. It's necessary. Then suddenly, things don't go right in the factory anymore. And the next thing I know, police come into my house and act like a person who are criminal. Fabio, I demand you turn down this job. 
Mrs. Lasolva, it is necessary. It's also necessary, Mrs. Lasolva, on account of my brother. <clears throat> Earl Cedar can expect Siberia. Don't you see? If we don't have the leaflets today, then they'll know it was Cedar who handed them out yesterday. Well, certainly. Even fools will notice that. Yesterday, leaflets were smuggled into the factory. Today, they arrest a man, and the smuggling stops. Everyone will know that the man they arrested did it. That's why it's necessary for the leaflets to be handed out again today. It's necessary. I see that. It's true. Something must be done to rescue this man you have dragged into things from being destroyed. What will happen to Bobby if he's arrested? It's not so dangerous. Not so dangerous. A man has been let in and drawn astray. If he is to be saved, this and that is necessary. But it's not dangerous. Well, if it's not dangerous, I, not Bobby, will hand out the leaflets. But how do you... Nobody must know who gives the leaflets out. Don't you worry about that. I could do it as well as you ever could. The noon lunch hour, my friend Maria Corsanova says lunch at the factory. Today, I will take her place. And I will wrap the food in your leaflets. Don't ask me to judge my mother's offer. On grapes? I think she can do it. She is known by the workers, and the police are suspicious of her. Ivan? <laughs> I think she can too. But supposing she is caught, less can happen to her than to us. She isn't in the movement, so obviously she's done it for her son. Comrade Blasov, in view of the dangerous situation and the great threat to our comrade, we wish to accept your mother's offer. We believe that she will, will run the least risk. It's all right with me. I'm sure this is a very bad cause I'm about to help him. But I must keep Fabio out of it. We are entrusting this packet of leaflets to you, Mrs. Blasova. So now you'll be fighting for us, won't you, Pavia Blasova? Fighting? I am hardly a young woman, and I'm not a fighter. If I can scrape up my three kopecks, that's fight enough for me. You don't know what the leaflets say? Mother is not able to read. Get that paper. <laughs> hey, Nicholas, can, I, can you tell me what's so interesting that's written on that paper there? I, I can't read. <laughs> I'll tell you, buddy. The police are hot after them already, and the factory security's been tightened too. But here's a new leaflet they've gotten out. They're a clever bunch of fellows. Nothing will stop them. Yes, and there's a lot of truth to what they say too. What I say is. Where I see a thing like this, I'm for it. Are all the people we can trust here? We've been bargaining, brothers. Did you get back the kopeck? We tallied it up for Mr. Sukhanov, and we showed him that it comes to 24,000 rubles a year when he takes a kopeck an hour out of the wages of 800 workers. Well, we stopped him. 
Those 24,000 rubles are not going into the pocket of Mr. Sukhanov. Did you get the Kopec back then? Just before our factory's east gate lies swamps which are a profound evil. So that's it. He plans to use it on the swamp. An expansion of the factory has been planned for the lands that would be reclaimed. New jobs would emerge from this. And what is good for the factory, as you know, is also good for you. Brothers, the company is doing less well than we perhaps believe. In fact, we are presently on the threshold of one of the greatest economic crises ever experienced by our nation. What you mean is capitalism is ailing and you are the doctor. Do you mean to say you're for taking the wage cuts? No other solution has emerged from our bargaining. Since you are unable to stop the wage cut, we demand that you stop negotiations with management. The swamp code is rejected. I warn against breaking off the bargaining. Can't you see this being a strike? Only a strike can save the COPAC. By the 1st of May, which gives us only a week, we must get other plans where wages are being cut to close down. Hey, do you think I should go on bargaining, considering the circumstances? Everybody in the factory yard reads their leaflets, Karpov, in spite of the police security. I'm afraid we don't have our people in hand any longer. There isn't much appeal left in draining the swamp, and that slogan about the swamp copec will finish us. Well, so strike. What's this here? <coughs> Another one of those leaflets? To me, somebody please. It goes to back on TV, guys. A reduction in pay would be a great wrong, and especially to me. For if the wages go down, how shall I make up with Fabio? He's already so discontent. Oh, at last she notices. It is my cause too, and the struggle is useful. Soon she will fight, soon she will be ready to say loudly, the battle is useful, for me especially. Is it you who hands these out then? You understand this little piece of paper means a strike? Strike, why is that? This leaflet summons the workers of the Sukhanov Works to strike. I know nothing about it. Then why do you hand them out? What do they arrest our people? Don't you even know what it says here? I'm not able to read. A strike is a bad thing. The company doesn't care if we ever work again. To us, it is life itself. What's the trouble? I just picked up two of these myself. And here's another. What's that you're reading? Where did you get that? <coughs> hey, let me go! Let me go! did was buy a pickle. Let's say that Mr. Sukhanov should not cut the wages in his factory just as he pleases. Nonsense! What do you hope to do about it? Mr. Sukhanov can cut the wages just as he pleases. Is it or isn't it his factory? It does belong to him. You see, then, this table belongs to me. Let me ask you, can I do just what I want with this table? Sure, Mrs. Vlasova. You can do whatever you want with this table. You see, can I cut up for kindling wood if I please? Yes, you can make kindling wood out of your table. Well then, if that's so, why can't Mr. Sukhanov do just what he wants with his factory, since it belongs to him, just like my table belongs to me? No, he can't. Why do you say no? It's 
because he needs workers in his factory. But what happens when he doesn't need you any longer? When he needs us, we must be there. When he doesn't need us, we are there anyway. Where could we go? He understands this. Although he doesn't always need us, we always need him. He counts on this. Although those are Mr. Suklanov's machines, they are also our tools. We have no others. We have no lathes. We have no weaving looms for the very reason that we make use of Mr. Sulkanov's machines. But when he closes it, he takes away our tools. That's because your tools belong to him. Yes, but do you think it is right for our tools to belong to him? No, I don't. But they still belong to him, whether I think it is right or wrong. Maybe someone else doesn't think it's right, but my table belongs to me. Well, listen, to that we say, there is a big difference between whether a table and a factory belongs to you. A table really can belong to you. Nobody's hurt by it. But when a factory belongs to you, you can hurt hundreds of people with it. In this case, you are a person who owns other people's tools. He can use his property to use us. Without us, the tools are no good at all. The moment they stop being our means of production, they turn into no more than the bare heap of scrap iron. Without us, you see, he cannot get along at all. Fine, but how do you suppose you'll prove to him that he needs you? It's like this. Suppose this fellow, Pavel Vlasov, walks up to Mr. Sukhanov. He says, Mr. Sukhanov, without me, your factory is nothing but a bare heap of scrap iron. And that's why you can't cut my wages, you please. Well, Mr. Sukhanov just laughs and throws him out. But if every Vlasov in Tver 800 Vlasovs get up and say the same thing, then Mr. Sukhanov will have to stop laughing. And that is what your strike is? Yes, that's what our strike is. And that's what it says in the leaflets. Right, that's what it says in the leaflets. But if the only thing in the leaflets is about a strike, why the police have to do with it? Why are people getting arrested? We ask you that, Mother. Why does it concern the police? If we make a strike against Mr. Sukhanov, that is no concern to the police. Everyone thinks that you want to do something violent. What <coughs> we ought to do is to show the city that your quarrel with the management is decent and peaceful. Ah, Miss Lassova, that is exactly what we plan to do. On the 1st of May, International Day of the Workers' Struggle, we'll be demonstrating for the right of the working class. We'll carry posters asking each and every last fact in Tver to support our fight for the Kopec. We <coughs> march blindly through the streets and just carry posters? No one can have a thing against it. We expect that Mr. Sukhanov will not want to go along with it. Well, he must go along with it. Probably the police will break up the demonstration. What do the police and Mr. Sukhanov have to do with one another? Mother, I guess you think the police won't have any problem with a peaceful demonstration? Yes, that is what I think since there's no violence in it. Fabio. I believe, as you know, in a God in heaven, and I will have nothing to do with violence. Although I've known nothing else for 40 years, I hope that at least when I die, I shall have done nothing violent.
workers of the Sokolov Works had just crossed over into the wool market when we came upon a column from the other plants. Already there were many thousands of us. We carried posters which declared workers, support our fight against the wage cuts, join our strike. We marched quietly in good order. Some songs were sung, rise, ye prisoners of starvation, and comrades, the bugles are sounding. Our factories marched along behind the great red flag. Next to me, close behind her son, marched Polly Gavlasova. When we came for him early in the morning, she suddenly came out of the kitchen, fully dressed. When we asked her where she was going, she said to us, I'm going with you. Many like her were with us, for many had come over to us because of the hard winter, the wage cuts in the factories, and our agitation. We saw a few policemen, and no soldiers at all, but at the corner of the boulevard of our savior in the Tereskaya, a double line of policemen suddenly was standing there. They spotted our flags and our posters, and a voice suddenly called out to us, Attention! Halt and disperse, or we will shoot! Also, drop the flag! Our column came to a halt. But since marchers at the rear were still moving forward, those who were in front could not stand their ground, and then there was shooting. The police began to move upon the crowd. I went to help demonstrate to help the workers' cause. The people marching there were decent, orderly people. They had worked hard all their lives. There were, of course, some desperate people, driven to extremes because they had no jobs, and some weak people, too weak to defend themselves. Since we were standing well to the front, when the shooting began, we did not disperse. We had our flag still. Smilgin was carrying it, and we had no intention of giving it up. For now it seemed to us, although we did not understand how, that they felt it was important to stop us, to knock us down and take our flag, the red flag, yes, ours, to take it away. But what we wanted was for all the people to see who we are and what we are for. We're just for the workers. The men against us were driven to act like wild animals. Why else did the Sukhanovs pay them their living? Everybody would come to see it in the end, and this flag, our red one, needed to be held especially high and in sight of all. The policemen, of course, but in sight of all the others, too. And for those who are not there to see it, they would be told about it. Not today, then tomorrow, for the years to come, until such a time as it was seen again. At this point in time, many of the movement were sure of it. It will be seen again and again, until such a time as everything its line of march has been changed. Our flag, the most threatening of all to rulers and exploiters, and unstoppable, and for the workers, the supreme flag. And so, so you will see it, again and again, gladly or ungladly, according to your place in this struggle, which cannot end otherwise, and with our total victory in all the cities of all the countries where there are workers. For 15 years I have been in the movement. I was one of the first to carry the revolutionary movement in the factories. We have fought for better pay and better working conditions. Often I have bargained with the owners in this cause, but that was all wrong. I stand here now and many thousands already at my back. And before us, once again, it is power that confronts us. Do we give up the flag? Don't give it up, Smeogan. You cannot bargain with them, we said. And the mother said to him, You must not give it up. Nothing can happen to you. The police will do nothing against a peaceful demonstration. At this moment, a police officer called out to us, Hand over the flag. Smilgin looked behind him and saw our posters, and on our posters, our demands. We watched to see what would be done with the flag by this man who stood next to us, one of us. Fifteen years in the movement, worker, revolutionary. On the 1st of May, 1905, 11 o'clock in the morning, at the corner of the Boulevard of Our Savior, the decisive moment, he said, I will not give it up. We are not bargaining. Good, Smilgan, we said. That's the way. Now everything will be all right. Yes, he said, and then he fell forward on his face, for they had shot him. And they ran toward him, four or five men, to seize the flag. A flag lay beside him. At that moment, our Polygay of Lasova 
gloss over the quiet one, the even-tempered, our comrade, bent down and reach for the flag. Let me have the flags, Milgan, I said. Give it here. I will take it. All of this must be changed. tavern, my head still aching with the aggravating arguments that idiot Sakar, who always contradicts me, though I am certainly in the right, and I at once <laughs> feel at peace within my own four walls. <coughs> I believe I shall read my newspaper and have a foot bath. So are you home already, Nikolai Ivanovich? Obviously. May I ask you to prepare me a foot bath? I shall take it in the kitchen. I am so glad you've come home, Nikolai Ivanovich. I'm so glad because now you must go out again. As the woman next door was just telling me, your friend, uh, Isak Artsnachikov, was here less than an hour ago. He has to speak with you at once, and he couldn't leave a message because, well, he has to speak with you personally. I'll go now. Go find him. I spent the entire evening with my friend Sakar Smerdikov. Uh, but the kitchen is such a mess, Nikolai Ivanovich. I just hung the washing up. Oh, and since when does my washing engage in gossip while it dries? Nikolai Ivanovich, I must confess, we are sitting around talking over a <coughs> cup of tea. Oh? 
And what sort of people are these? Uh, I'm not sure if you would feel comfortable with him, Nikolai Ivanovich. These are not well-to-do people. Ah! Then you're talking politics again! Is that unemployed fellow Sostakovich among them? <laughs> yes, and his wife and his brother and his aunt and uncle. They are all very bright people, and I'm sure you would follow their conversation with interest. Hello, Gail. Vlasova, have I not made it perfectly clear to you that I do not wish politics in my home? Here I come home, tired from the tavern, and what do I find in my kitchen but politics? I am astonished, <laughs> Mrs. Vlasova, astonished! I'm so sorry I had to disappoint you, Nikolai Ivanovich, but I was just telling the people about the 1st of May. They don't know enough about it. Oh, and what do you know about it, Mrs. Vlasova? Just this evening, I was telling my friend Sakhar Smerdikov. Sakhar, I said, there's nothing more difficult or hard to understand than politics. I know how tired and tense you must be, yet if you had but a little time, all of us here tonight will agree that, well, you could explain a lot to us about the things that are hard to understand, about the first of May, too. I suppose you know how little I desire to get in a quarrel with that unemployed Sostakovich. At the most, I could supply a few of the fundamentals of politics, Bring along the samovar and some bread and some pickles, too. So you want to learn to read. I can't imagine why you need it in your position. What in your mind, I would think. But I shall try, just as a favor for Mrs. Blasova. Have you all something to write with? Good. We will begin with three easy words. Branch. Nest. Fish. I repeat. Branch. <laughs> Nest. interested in class struggle. You're here to learn reading and writing, and that's something you can do. Reading, too, is class struggle. <laughs> reading is class struggle? What's that supposed to mean, reading is class struggle? All right, this means worker. Do you want to know what reading is class struggle means? It, it means we can print our own kind of pamphlets and read our own kind of books once we can read and write. Well, then we can be leaders in the class struggle. Look here. Although I am a teacher and have for 12 years taught reading and writing, there's something I want to tell you. I know that everything at bottom is nonsense. Books are nonsense. They only help man become worse and worse. Why, the simplest peasant is by far the better man, simply for not having been spoiled by civilization. Please, can you tell me, how do I write class struggle? Shostakovich, you must put your hand down firmly, otherwise it trembles, and nobody can read your writing. Class struggle. Okay. And writing a straight line, and not over the edge. Whoso over, whosoever oversteps the margin, oversteps the law. Knowledge has been heaped upon knowledge for generation and generation on, book after book has been written. As for technical knowledge, we've never had so much. And what use is it all? It just leads to confusion. I say we should raise a resistance against the knowledge. Have you finished? At times, I sink into a deep melancholy. And at these moments, I ask myself, what if the 
truly great thoughts, thoughts concerned not merely with the here and now, but with the eternal, the lasting, the universal man. What have these to do with class struggle? Ideas like that are useless. While you're so busy sunk in melancholy, you are exploiting us. Pavel Shostakovich, be quiet. How do I write exploitation? <laughs> exploitation is something that exists only in books. Do you ever imagine that I could have exploited anyone? You can only say that because you don't get any of the loot. since their arrest, they said they've been swallowed up in an earthquake. Well, the movement suffers too, because Pavio, for instance, is the only one who has the addresses. The peasants who want our papers. Well, then we must go and talk to the peasants. <laughs> you would have to talk to a great many people to do that, Mrs. Blossom. There are some 120 million peasants in Russia. <laughs> well, revolution is something you will never have in this country, not with these people. That must be left to the West. Now, the Germans, they are revolutionary. I believe they will have a revolution. <laughs> What's the matter, Ivan? Why, Nikolai, where is your splendid port for the Tsar gone? The room looks positively empty without it. I thought I would take it down for a while. How boring it was, always having it there before one. I can't believe you took it down simply because you thought it was boring. Don't you say that. Nikolai Ivanovich is always on the lookout for something new. Brother, I can't remember when you ever changed anything in your room. Mm -hmm. Why, the frame alone must have cost you 12 rubles. In that case, I can hang it up again. You've always considered me a fool, Ivan. That's why you yourself are a fool. Why, <laughs> you lie. <coughs> your contemptuous attitude toward the czar positively astonishes me. Your eyes, too, you take on such a masterful glance. Even to look at you is dangerous. Stop making your brother angry. He is a very intelligent man. What he has to say is important. He has many small children learning something from him. Besides, he has taught us how to read and write. I hope while you were teaching them, you learned something yourself. Not at all. I haven't learned a thing. Even now, there is very little these poor people understand about Marxism. I do not wish to offend you, Mrs. Vlasova. But Marxism is very naturally a most complicated matter. Not comprehensible, save the trained mind. But what is odd is that the ones who gulp it down like hotcakes are the ones who understand this fact the least. Now, Marxism. 
Baptism has nothing wrong with it per se. In fact, there's much that can be said for it. But great deficiencies do exist. And at several key points, Marx viewed matters completely wrong. I could say much on this subject. The economic aspect is important, granted. But not only is the economic aspect important. Nonetheless, it is important. And what is sociology? As for myself, I must consider, for example, biology to be fully as important. I ask myself where the universal man is in this doctrine. The human being will ever remain the same. But he has already changed a bit, don't you think? Pelagea, I no longer recognize my brother. Country in the lunch and the hour of danger is a rat. And that's what a worker who strikes is. Someone who this country in the lunch. What do you mean, this country? This is Russia. And they are Russian. Russia belongs to the Russians. Oh, really? You bet. Anyone who can't feel that. You know, my meat's a little raw still. Well, you just can't explain it to such people. But you can beat their skulls in. Perfectly right. This table is fatherland, and this meat is fatherland. But it's a little raw still. This spot where I'm sitting is fatherland. And listen here, you're a hunk of the fatherland too. But I'm a little raw too. A man <laughs> ought to defend his fatherland. That's if it is his. You're just talking that dirty material about Asshole. Oh. Won't oh. you please, please take a seat here? And you should have something to eat to get over your shock. <coughs> they threw a stone at her. That's the woman. She rode with us on the train. It was the strikers who did that to her. We were worried for her. It feels a little better now. God be thanked. Such a bruise. How much more sympathy there is from a bruise from those expecting them than from those dealing them out. Here is a Russian woman struck with stones by Russian workers. Are you a mother? Yes. A Russian mother struck with stones. Yes, Russian stones. <laughs> and I have to serve my good soup to this bunch. Why did they 
throw them at you. They saw me walking with strike breakers. What a bunch of rats they are. What do you mean, rats? Do you know what I was just thinking? That maybe they're not rats at all. If they're not, then why did they throw stones at you? Because they thought I was a rat. How could they ever think that? They thought I was a strike breaker. Then you think we should throw stones at strike breakers? Well, certainly. Ha ha ha! Let her have some food! Give her something right away! Two plates full! My name is Vasil Yufimovich. And bring in the help! I want them to see this. This woman was stoned by the strikers. She has a bruise on her head. See? Here it is. Just now I asked her, where did she get the bruise? She says, they took me for a strike breaker. I ask, do you mean we should throw stones at strike breakers? And what do you suppose she said? Yes. When I heard that, dear friends, I said, give us some food. Two plates full. <laughs> but why don't you eat it? Is it too hot for you? Why did you have to set steaming hot food before her? Do you want her to burn her mouth? No, Vasil Yefimovich. The food is not too then hot. Then why don't you eat it? It was cooked for strike breakers. What did you say? It was cooked for strike breakers. Oh, well, that's a new one. <laughs> this is getting interesting. That makes me a rat too, doesn't it? Look at me. I am a rat. And why am I a rat? Because I give support to strike breakers. Isn't that right? But isn't it wrong to strike? Or do you think it all depends upon the reason for the strike? What you mean is the pay was cut. But why do you think the pay can't be cut? Just look around you. All you can see out there. It all belongs to Mr. Smirnoff who lives in Odessa. And why shouldn't he cut the wages? Yeah. Isn't it his money? Maybe you don't think he can set wages one time at two rubles, another time at two kopecks. Why, you don't believe that either. Huh. Well, but what happened just last year? My wages were cut too. Even that. And what did I do? On your advice? Nothing. And what will happen in September? My wages will be cut again. So what am I making myself guilty of now? Of treason. Of treason to the people whose pay was cut too and who didn't go along with it. What does this make me then? So you won't eat my food. I have been waiting for a respectable human being to tell me to my face that as a respectable human being, she can eat my food. Now the cup is full. The cup has been full a long time. It needed just a drop for it to run over. Anger and discontent are not enough. So, a thing must have practical results. You tell your Mr. Smirnoff he can send up your food from Odessa. And you, you can cook it yourselves. Look, pick! Now don't get all worked up. It wasn't for nothing that I cooked in factory canteens. It was because I couldn't take the crap I got out of them. I told myself, I will go into the country. It's decent there. And what do I find? Another dung heap. Well, we can move back there again. And I'm supposed to stuff my food into strike breakers. Damn right, we are moving. Bring in the kettle of lentils. And you, get all the bacon, whatever you can find. <coughs> What's it been cooked for? You're going to be sorry. You'll bring us to a bad end yet. Get out of here, you saviors of the fatherland! 
We're on strike. The kitchen help is striking. Out! As the butcher, I've gotten into the habit of being the one who laughs last, and not the pig. <laughs> now, go and tell the ones who stoned you that their suit's waiting. Here is our comrade Blaslova, a good fighter. Tenaciously done and indispensable. Wherever she fights, she is not alone. Others like her fight tenaciously, reliably, cleverly, in Tavern, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, and Chicago, Shanghai, and Calcutta. Of all countries, good small balls. Unknown souls of the revolution. You cannot set that printing press up here in my house. Now, you know I would you theoretically, but printing them here, that I cannot have. Did I hear you right, Nikolai Ivanovich, that you are in favor of our working? Why, you yourself wrote the last pamphlet for the Workers' Alliance, I might remind you, and yet you don't want them printed. Well, I do, but not here. <laughs> we make note of this, Nikolai Ivanovich. And what if you do? Once Mrs. Blasova has something in her head, there's no stopping her. By 8 o'clock, the paper has to be ready. We must print more newspapers tonight. They just keep confiscating them. Just when the oppression turns strongest is when the people turn indifferent and pretend they're happy with all the dirt and meanness. noise, I can't have you print illegal, illegal documents here. We've noticed it too, Nikolai Ivanovich. The machine is a bit loud. If we only had something to put under it, the apartment next door wouldn't hear a thing. Do you have anything to put under it, Nikolai Ivanovich? No, not a thing. I've already supplied you with a house. Don't make such a noise. The woman next door has a piece of felt in her closet. She's saving it to make coats for her children. I'll go next door and ask her for it. Don't think while well, I'm Please, please don't be angry with her. At first, we didn't want to involve her in illegal printing work, but ever since she got involved in the movement, she won't have it any other way. How do you do? My name is Pavel Vlasov. Does Pelagia Vlasova leave here? Pavel. She'll be back in a minute. Are they after you? Yes, that also. I have to go on to Finland tonight. Well, sit, sit down over here. Let's give your mother a big surprise. <laughs> Until tomorrow morning, 
It would do your children more good than a fancy coat would. But you really would not listen to me. Such stubbornness you have never seen. Not even for the promise of two kopecks. Oh, what's that? Well, the felt, naturally. Why are you going complaining about this Marfa Caternova, then? Because she made me steal it, since we absolutely <laughs> had it. We thank you in the name of the revolution, Polygia Vlasova, for this felt. I'll give it back to her in the morning. Uh, don't you want some bread with butter? And who will take the pages out of the machine? Look in the cupboard. The knife is in the drawer below. Don't worry about me. I was able to find a slice of bread, even in Siberia. Do you hear him? He's blaming me. I don't listen to him. The least I could do is cut it for you. Uh, and who would take the pages out? Certainly not me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the mother of the revolutionist, Pavel Vlasov, takes the pages out. Does she pay any attention to him? Not at all. Does she pour him his soup? Draw his bath water? Or kill the fatted calf? Not at all. He flees from Siberia toward Finland. The icy gusts of the north wind at his back the volleys of the gendarmes in his ears, and he finds no place where he might find sanctuary, save in a print shop. And instead of bending over him to stroke his hair, his mother is taking the pages out. If, if you want to help me, come here. Everything was fine until the typhoid epidemic came. Anyways, have you always been able to eat enough? <coughs> yes, until there was nothing. <laughs> Where will you go from here? Will you be gone long? Not if you hear work like this. Will you be working there, too? Yes, and it is equally important, there and here. You must go once, Pavio. Here are your tickets. Comrade Issa waits for you at the railroad station. He has your finished passports. I hoped I would have at least a few hours, but it doesn't matter. I'll go down there with you. No, that is dangerous for Pabiel. You are known, he is not. Until next time, then, Mother. Let's hope next time I can fix you with bread with butter. Goodbye, comrades. God goes with him, Mrs. Vlasova. I'm not so sure. How often you hear how quickly mothers lose their son. <coughs> but I have kept my son. <coughs> how have I kept him? Through a third, the cause. He and I were two. The third it was, the common cause commonly driving us. That, that is, is what united us. How often I myself have heard sons talking with their parents. But how much better our talks were about the third, that cause which we held in common. For many people, the great and common cause. How close we were to each other, this cause near. How good we were for each other, this good cause near. What does it all come to? That's 49 kopecks total. 49 kopecks. You see, Sonia, and I have still to buy you a coat. She always seems to be so cold. Well, she's much too thin. No wonder she's how can you let her run around like that when it's snowing so much? Oh, but I only have 20 kopecks left. Do you have coats for that much? 
you do need a coat. Now, for 20 kopecks, Cobra, what you needed, this would be your coat. Put my pattern back where you got it from. Oh, it's only a joke. But why must you mock the child? Is it I mock Sonia? Or Mr. Murotov at the coat manufacturer? <laughs> Sonia requires a coat for a few kopecks. Are you saying it is not warm? Then a warm coat is what she should have required. What you want to say is that I'm guilty for not giving her a coat as a gift. I don't demand anything of you. I know you can't do anything like that. Did you really mean that the shop mistress was guilty? No. The only guilty person is Sonia. <laughs> anyway, I won't be able to buy the coat. It isn't right for you to buy if the price is too much for you. You don't need a coat at all, Sonia, if the cost is too much. I only have 20 kopecks left. No more. I recognize this woman. She goes around everywhere, sowing discontent. She has to pay the manufacturers for the coats. But these, these aren't coats. They're, they're not warm. And those, those aren't coats either. Those are merchandise. But Sonia can't buy any other coat if the coat manufacturer wants to make his profit. Now go outside in your little coat, Sonia, and tell the snow it has to protect you, since Mr. Murata will not protect you. You have the wrong parents, Sonia. They haven't the slightest idea how to get coats for you. Now go and tell the snow and the wind that here is where it should snow. For here is where the coats hang. in chains, still forced by his comrades, and bound about him by his comrades. He saw while they took him how the factories grew more dense chimney by chimney, and since it was dawn, the usual time for leading them out, the factories still stood empty. But he saw them filled with that mighty force which ever had grown and grew still. They caught Pavel Vlasov as he tried to cross into Finland, and they shot him. We're going to forget all our quarrels with Mrs. Vlasova and sit down with her like Christians to show our sympathy. Like to do some reading. You may keep it for as long as you like. 
Thank you, Miss Nolka. But would you be most offended if I did not accept it? The teacher Nikolai lets me borrow his books while he's away on vacation. Seemed to me you wouldn't <coughs> want to read those political newspapers of yours now. Really? Do you read them every day? Yes. My Bible has often been a great consolation to me, Mrs. Klosova. Did you any photographs of him? No. I had a few, but we destroyed them so the police would get their hands on them. A person should have things like that for remembrance. They say he was such a fine man. <coughs> Wait, I do remember. I do a photograph of him. This is the warrant for his arrest. Newspaper for me. <coughs> it says right here in black and white, Miss Lusso, that your son was a criminal. He never had a bleep, and you made no secret of being the same. I might even add, you take every opportunity to let us know what you think of our fate. Yes, nothing, Vera Sapnova. You've not yet come to another conviction? No, Vera Sapnova. Can you still believe that reason alone will accomplish everything? Vera Sapnova, I told you, Mrs. Lusso, that surely wouldn't have changed her views for yours. But not long ago in the night, I heard from the wall how you will meet me. I hope you can excuse me. There is no need to excuse yourself. That's naturally not how I meant it. But did you weep because of reason? No. Now you see just how far you'll get with your reason. When I wept, it was not because of reason. But when I stopped weeping, it was not because of unreasonableness. What Pavel has done was good. Why was he shot then? Because all of them were against him? Yes. But when they were against him, they were also against themselves. Mankind needs God, Pelagia of Lasova. We are helpless against fate. No, what we, what we say is this. The fate of man is man. Dear Mrs. Lasova, we peasants think otherwise. My relative, she's just visiting. We who are peasants think otherwise. Here, there is no seed in the field, only a loaf of bread in the bread box. You see only the milk. You do not see the cow. You have no idea of those sleepless nights with the thunderstorm up there in the heavens. And what is the meaning of hail to you? I see. And at these times you pray to God? Yes. And in the spring you go on processions and pilgrimages. That's right. And then the thunderstorms come. And in spite of everything, the cow gets sick. Aren't there any peasants in your region who have insurance against crop failure and cattle disease? Uh, I hear that there are. Well, there you go. When praying does no good, insurance will help you. That's how it is. <laughs> we have no need to pray to God anymore when the thunderclouds stand overhead. But you must be insured. That will help you. And if God loses his importance, well, that is too bad for God. Which gives reason to hope that once his God has disappeared from your field, he'll be gone from your heads as well. When I was young, we all still believed that there was a God up in heaven somewhere. And he looked like an old man. But then the airplanes came, and in the newspapers you could read how everything in the heavens could be measured. And, and then people stopped talking about a God who was up in heaven, and they started talking about a God who was like a gas. Nowhere yet, everywhere. But then you could read what the gases composing everything were made of. We knew what air was, so he couldn't go on being like air. He got more and more dispersed, until you might say, he just evaporated. Nowadays, he's more like just a spiritual symbol. But even that is very doubtful, Lydia Antonovna. Are you, are you saying he's not so important anymore because we can't see any signs of him? Pelagia Blasova, don't you forget why God is taking your Pavel from you. The Tsar took him from me, not God. God took him, not the Tsar. Lydia Antonovna, as I hear, the God who took my Pavel from me is planning on taking your two rooms from you come next Saturday. Is that true? Has God given you your eviction notice? It was I who gave her eviction notice. She hasn't paid her rent for three times running. Vera Stefanovna, God has ordained you will not receive those three rent payments. And what have you done about it? You've thrown Lydia Antonovna out on the street. Lydia Antonovna, perhaps you ought to ask our dear landlady to lend you her Bible so you can leaf through it and read to your children about how we should fear God out in the street in the cold. Your son would still be living today if you read more to him from the Bible. <coughs> Living living badly. Why is it you fear death? My son has no such great fear. <coughs> but he shuddered at the misery in our street, apparent to every eye. Hunger is what shocks us, and the degradation of those who notice it and cause it. Do not fear death, but rather the inadequate life. <coughs> Lydia, 
Stepnovna, why fear God? You should fear Vera Stepnovna instead. It was not the inscrutable will of God which carried my Pavla, but the clear will of the Tsar. Just as Lydia Antonovna is kicking you out of your home because some man who sits in his villa collects all trace of godliness is chased you from your job. Why speak of God? Although they say there are many mansions in our father's house, there are certainly too few in Russia. That they don't tell you, and they don't tell you why. Here at Stepanovna, in the Bible it says very clearly, love thy neighbor. Why are you throwing me out on the street then? <coughs> they shot Pavel Vlasov because he was for the workers and a worker himself. That's clear enough. Not for that reason you won't get my Bible from me, not for that reason. Your Bible is no good if I can't see any Bible him. For what reason? <coughs> hit very badly. She is an old woman. What did the newspapers say? Five delegates we sent to the Duma have been arrested. Let's go buy a copy of the latest extra. They're out to destroy the party now. carry posters that said, down with the war, long live the revolution, and our red flags. There is still so much I have to do. I, Pelagea Vlasova, the mother of a worker and the widow of a worker. Many years ago, it disturbed me to see my son was not satisfied. At first, I only despaired, but that did no good. I decided to join him in his fight for the Kopec. 
We were involved in the time at small strikes for better wages. Now, here we are, in the midst of the ammunition factory, for the fight for the power of the state. Many people say what we want will never happen. We should be content with what we have. Anyway, the power of the ruling class is absolute. Time after time, we will be beaten down. Many of the workers also say it will never happen. If you still live, never say never. What is certain is not certain. The way that things are will not last. When the ruling class has spoken, the rule shall raise their voices. Who dare say never? Who's to blame when oppression rules? We are. Who, Who is responsible where the rule is smashed? We are. Those beaten down shall rise up tall. Whoever is lost fights back. Who can restrain the man who sees his situation? The victims of today will be the victors of tomorrow. And never is changed into today. Into the night. 